I'm Dave Kluge, and you are listening to the Dynasty Hot Seat. Yes, hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Dynasty Hot Seat, the only Dynasty show out there that is a certified inferno. And today we've got, it's one of my favourite things ladies and gentlemen, a brand new guest on the show. Love it whenever we get the best and brightest in the industry to come on and hey, we got a doozy right here today. We got Dave Kluge coming in from the football guys. Dave, long time coming, been a big fan of your work for ages, great to have you on the Dynasty Hot Seat. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Really appreciate you having me on. Uh, this is a fun time of year. Um, I think at this yeah. point, you know, the uh, rookie rankings move a lot, you know, with the, the the pre-draft process and then we get draft capital and that changes things up quite a bit. And then we start getting some reports out and things like that. But I think at this point, we're not really moving rookie rankings too much. I'd say from here to the season, we don't want to overreact too much to OTAs and rookie mini camps and those things that are going to be happening. So uh, I, I think at this point, the kind a process for ranking our rookies is uh i don't want to say set in stone but but close to it it's it's definitely pretty close right? and you'll be one of our last people this year to to put in your mark and say these are my my rookie rankings for now as we as we get into that redraft kind of mode and, and picking teams with all the veterans and all the rookies mixed in so dave you're going to have one of the final says on this rookie class and before we jump into the class as a whole just wanted to say hey everybody welcome along to the dynasty Hudson. if you are new here always appreciate that thumbs up always appreciate that likes and and all of that good stuff subscribing to the channel as well hey dave do you know that 74 percent of people watching right now they're not subscribed to this channel what the hell are they doing yeah why not i i, I will drop a, uh, a subscribe as soon as this show goes live um Yes. Yeah, I don't think there's any downside to subscribing. You know, you just get more content on your YouTube feed. Absolutely agree. So if you're not already subscribed, make sure you're doing that. Absolutely. And Dave, before we dive into this mock draft that we're going to do, do you no, have any general? I'm already subscribed. I can't subscribe. I can't subscribe again. And I'm already subscribed to the channel. So. And we all know Dave's a smart guy. So come on, you can, you can be <laughs> like Dave and, and subscribe as well. So Dave, before before we jump in, any generalizations about this class that that you've noticed in, in general, like, and also people talk about, you know, really good for quarterbacks, really good for running back. What, what's your general feel for this 24 class, maybe compared to other classes we've seen? Yeah, I think the the quarterbacks are obviously kind of the marquee position here. Um, we, we knew that before the draft, and then we got the surprise selections of Michael Penix and Bo Nix, and that just made it even deeper. I mean, just absolutely insane to see how many quarterbacks went in the top 15 of this draft, something we've never, ever seen before. But really, just the overall uh, uh, offensive weapons. I mean, we didn't see... Remind me, I don't know off the top of my head. I think it was pick 17 was the first defensive player we saw. I mean, yeah. teams are skewing much heavier towards uh, investing in their offenses now. I, I think when you look at the receivers, there is going to be receiver gold in this class. I mean, it's almost yeah. especially the top three that we talk about, uh, you know, with Marvin Harrison, Caleb Williams, Roma Dunze. But then outside of that, we saw this run of receivers in the late first, early second round. And with those guys, it's really tough to project who the guy is going to be. You know, some of those guys are going to break out. Some are going to fall a little bit flat. But, um, you know, with with the receivers going where they did, with the quarterbacks going where they did, I mean, there's going to be gold midway through the second round of your rookie drafts. Um, you know, we're going to do our best to try to find it. But this is a deep, deep class for quarterbacks and wide receivers. And I'm doing a positional yeah. series right now where I break down every single position, look at the dynasty landscape, the current markets and all that, and – I'm not, you know, reinventing the wheel by saying this here, but quarterbacks and wide receivers are the safest assets you can have in Dynasty. So we're getting a lot of uh, safe assets that are flushing the market right now, and that's a good spot to be in. Awesome, awesome year to be a rebuilder this year, right, Dave? Oh, yeah. If you've got multiple first-round picks, and if multiple of those first-round picks are sitting inside the top eight, this is how you just completely flip your team around. Yeah, absolutely. And let's let's get into this draft then. We spoke about that top eight. We're going to go through the top eight. We're going to go through all the way through two rounds here. Dave, you're going to make 
every single pick. How exciting is that? And Ooh. we are super flex. We're non tight end premium. That always gets a little interesting. Chat about Brock Bowers and where you would do it him if it was in the tight end premium. So let's uh, let's roll into one one. And the big question with this is: Do you even have a debate in your mind about who is the one one at this stage? Uh, it, it's Caleb Williams for me. Um, I think yeah. that's the standard one hundred and one here. That being said, I think the top three are kind of in a tier by themselves, and we'll discuss those. Uh, Caleb Williams, I think, um, is, is the safest, and I think that's why yeah. I want to take him 101. I don't want to swing for the fences when I know that I'm getting somebody who basically his floor is, you know, being a top 10, top 12 quarterback. Look at Trevor Lawrence, for instance. You know, people are saying that he is a bust, but he's still giving us QB1 numbers. He's somebody you can confidently. Yeah your lineup he may not have lived up to his lofty draft capital at the time but he's still a guy that you're gonna be able to start for the next eight to ten years in fantasy and i think that's kind of the floor outcome for caleb williams as well he also has some sneaky rushing upside where he can be a six yeah. seven hundred yard rusher and really elevate that ceiling as well what it comes down to for me is the landing spot um you know getting to throw to dj moore and uh Keenan Allen and Roma Dunze and Cole Komet and having DeAndre Swift and Roshan Johnson and Khalil Herbert out of the backfield, having a good offensive line. I don't know if a number one overall pick has ever fallen into a better situation. So Caleb Williams is the 101 for me, but I think there's a pretty strong argument you can make for the 102 as well. Oh, you, you can't you can't just tease us like that, Dave. You got to go straight into it. Who's who's the 102 and, what, and what's the argument? Let us know. So my 102 is Jaden Daniels, and um, I know yep. a lot of people, you know, I, like I said, I think this top three is pretty tight, and we'll talk about Marvin Harrison mm -hmm. in a bit. But with Jaden Daniels, man, his ceiling outcome, like if it all works out for Jaden Daniels, he could easily outscore Caleb Williams. I mean, this is a guy who rushed for 1,134 yeah. yards last year in college. He led the NCAA in rushing yards per attempt, and he also threw. All over the field. He was graded as the third best passer in the NCAA by PFF last year. And a lot like we just said with Caleb Williams, he lands in a great spot where he's got Terry McLaurin. He's got Jahan Dotson. He's got Zach Ertz. He's got Austin Eckler. He's got um, Brian Robinson. They added Ben Sinnott in the draft this year. So yeah. he is on a team flush with weapons as well. And he's also got Cliff Kingsbury, the same guy that we saw turn Kyler Murray into a guy who is just scoring fantasy points as easy as breathing just given this consistent top <laughs> five seasons so i i think there's obviously a, a floor outcome with Jaden daniels where if he can't get the sacks under control we could see him on a similar trajectory to a justin fields you know where three years yeah. from now they say you know we just can't make it work with this guy but if everything works out for Jaden Daniels. If he can be that 800 to 1,000 yard rusher while still passing with the weapons around him, I think there's going to be a strong case that Jaden Daniels can be going as as high as top five in startups next year. Yeah, we, we've seen what happened with Justin Fields. Even though he wasn't like producing on the field for the Bears, he was producing in fantasy and that really just skyrocketed his value all the way up. One of my favorite stats about Daniels is he was third in the SEC for rushing. And that's even with that yes. college stat where you lose yards for being sacked. He still yep. was third in the SEC for rushing ahead of all of those amazing running backs. That is just an incredible athlete. And I can't not mention, I mean, the jersey sitting behind you, Lamar Jackson, mm -hmm. he needs to take a couple of, couple of notes from Lamar's page, especially about how to take a hit. Is that the big thing you're oh. worried about with Daniels? Yeah, and I think that's something he'll learn. I mean, those uh, those lowlights were unbelievable last year. He was just getting lit up, and it's it's uh, yeah. unbelievable that he avoided a major injury. Um, but but I think the biggest thing that he needs to learn how to do is to evade pressure. And I think that mm -hmm. what they did, you know, Cliff Kingsbury has really, you know, we saw him kind of change Kyler Murray's game. You look at Kyler Murray in college, he was just ripping a deep ball on 20% of his attempts. And then when he came into the pros, they start running this air raid attack. And all of a sudden he's checking down a lot more and he's avoiding sacks. And I think that Cliff Kingsbury is a good coach to kind of change Jaden Daniels tendencies a little bit. And I do have some concerns about Austin Eckler, you know, 29 years old, coming off a down season, but he's the exact type of safety valve that you want to have for a quarterback that you're trying to develop to avoid sacks. So if Cliff Kingsbury can coach Jaden Daniels up and say, hey, you're going to have Ben Sinnott open in the flat and you're going to have Austin Eckler out on the opposite side, rather than taking those hits, just check down to these veterans, uh, Zach Ertz as well. You know, I, I think he's going to have a lot of options to get the ball out of his hand quickly, and hopefully we don't see him holding on to the ball and taking those sacks that we saw in college.
Yeah, absolutely. If he puts all together, he's he's going to be absolute dynasty gold for sure. And you mentioned three guys being in your in your top tier. Marvin Harrison Jr. Is he the guy, or are you going with another quarterback with all these quarterbacks flying around? No, it's it's Marvin Harrison Jr. for me, and um, we know he's a great prospect. You know, he's got the production profile in college. He's got all of the measurables that we want to see. But really, it just comes down to him landing. Like we said about Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels landing in an ideal situation. Like Kyler Murray yeah. is now over a full year removed from his ACL tear. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and uh, first of all, if you've made this argument, I'm sorry, but I've heard a lot of people saying like, well, you know, DeAndre Hopkins was really good in Arizona. So Kay or Marvin Harrison is going to be really good in Arizona. And I don't think that's fair to just set yeah. the expectations for Marvin <laughs> Harrison to be one of the best receivers in the league. But uh, on the flip side, we have seen that Kyler Murray is pretty content to just pepper his wide receiver one with targets. And, you know, two years ago, if we look back at the 2022 season when Marquise Brown was the wide receiver one and DeAndre Hopkins was suspended, he was pulling over 10 targets per game. So I think that is a tendency that we've been able to notice from Kyler Murray over the years is that he finds a guy that he likes and he just hyper targets him. So, um, you know, this is a team that is desperate for a wide receiver one. The only real target competition in Arizona is Trey McBride. Trey McBride and Marvin Harrison are going to be operating in very different parts of the field. So mm -hmm. you've got Marvin Harrison, a very, very good prospect, landing on a team that needs a wide receiver one and has a veteran quarterback who has proven that he can sustain elite wide receiver one potential. So for me, Marvin Harrison is the 103, but I've seen him go 101 in super flex drafts and really like... I prefer him, Williams, Daniels, Harrison. But if you want to go Harrison, Daniels, Williams, like I, I don't care. You can shuffle these three up in any order, and it does make a big difference for me. I've asked a couple of people this question, Dave, and everyone's sort of taken it back at first and then goes, oh, actually, maybe. But I've got a real sort of hot take. Okay. I think we're on the hot seat. This time, and we're on the hot, exactly. I think this time next year, People are taking Marvin Harrison Jr. as dynasty wide receiver one overall. I think he could overtake Justin Jefferson. I mean, it, it's very much so in the range of outcomes. And, and he doesn't need to have a record-breaking season. You know, he doesn't need yeah. to go out and catch 1,600, 1,700 yards. I think if we can see him, you know, hit 1,200 yards, 1,300 yards, that's going to be enough because he already has the pedigree. We know the situation is great. A guy like Puka Nakua or Amonra St. Brown that got off to red-hot yeah. starts in their career – they kind of had uh, Puka Nakua is still kind of proving people that he can do it. We aren't ready to vault him up there, but because Marvin Harrison has checked every single box besides NFL production, an 11, 12, 1300 yard season, I think would be enough to push him ahead of Jefferson, Chase, Lamb, and all those guys. Yeah, it's just like people, it's just, it also feels like there's a sense of inevitability about Marvin Harrison. I feel like people are just waiting to put that crown in him, right? It seems like it's just me meant to happen. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And so we got those top three, your top three tiered locked in. Dave, who's following up at the 104? So for me, um, again, this is a, I've got a little mini tier here uh, at four and five. And again, like I, I like to operate inside tiers and you hosting a dynasty show. I'm sure you talk about this all the time as well. Like mm -hmm. you don't want to get too married to one player. You want to put these guys in tiers and then operate within that tier because then you can trade yeah. back you know, pile on additional assets and still get the player that you wanted. So I prefer Malik neighbors right here at the one Oh four spot. Um, I just think that he's a better player. Uh, you know, he was drafted before Roma Dunze and I know that there are questions. So I, I guess I can kind of get ahead right now and we'll say Roma Dunze at five and I can kind of talk about both of <laughs> these guys at the same time, if you don't mind. Cool. Um, Absolutely. The, they're both very, very talented players. And for me, the deciding factor is draft capital. And as we've seen with rookies, you know, we get married to our uh, pre-draft takes. But at the end of the day, the metric that correlates closest to fantasy production is draft capital. And we saw Malik Neighbors be the preferred wide receiver in this class ahead of Roma Dunze. And I know people immediately are going to say, well, Roma Dunze doesn't have a quarterback. And I don't know your thoughts on Daniel Jones. I am very much so out on Daniel Jones. I will agree yeah. that, Roma, or that Malik Neighbors doesn't have a quarterback, but you could make the same argument against Roma Dunze that you know he has intense target competition. So I think the yeah. year one projections for both of these guys are kind of tough. 
I'd actually prefer neighbors in redraft as well as in dynasty, because I think that he at least has a path to pull in a 30, 35% target share. Even if they're not great targets, even if it's a low scoring offense, he's going to get peppered with targets. And I think that that is going to insulate his profile going into 2025. We're going to say, yeah, you know, maybe he only had eight, 900 yards, but he pulled a 35% target share. You know, his targets per route run were, you know, off the charts. We're going to be able to look at that efficiency profile the same way that we've looked at Drake London and Garrett Wilson and Kyle Pitts and these other guys who are insulating value year over year. I think we get that with Malik Neighbors. Roma Dunze, even though I've got him as my 105 right now, He's a guy that I expect to fall in value. And I made the comp immediately yeah. on draft night when he got drafted. I said, this is Jackson Smith, the Jigba 2.0, where he's a very talented yeah. player getting drafted in the first round, but he has two very good veterans ahead of him. And then the other hurdle that he is going to have, not only does he have two talented veterans ahead of him, but he also has a rookie quarterback. And we've seen historically that rookie quarterbacks struggle to support multiple fantasy relevant wide receivers. So I, I love a Dunze. Um, in the pre-draft process, I did have a Dunze ahead of neighbors, but I think looking at the situations and the draft capital now, that was enough for me to move neighbors ahead of a Dunze. And I think as well with, with the situation with Malik neighbors now, it's, even though it sounds weird to say, it's much easier to go out and fix the quarterback, even though that's the hardest position like in sure. sports, than completely change a whole receiving room. You mentioned it earlier, Dunes has got you know all those weapons you listed for Caleb. It's gonna take a while for DJ Moore to fade out, for DeAndre Swift to Cole Komet, all these guys. It's gonna take a while for Odunze to come in and establish himself. But with neighbors, I mean, this time next year it could be Kirk Cousins throwing him passes and everyone loves him, right? And and that's I, I like to operate in that area of the unknown, especially in Dynasty. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, I spent all last offseason buying Drake London and buying Kyle Pitts. And there's so many people that are saying, you know, Desmond Ritter, Marcus Mariota, these guys are care terrible. And, and, and I didn't care. I wasn't buying them for their immediate 2023 production. I was buying them because I knew they were talented players and their position or their situation could change. I don't think anybody, if you rewind 365 days ago, nobody in the world was saying Kirk Cousins is going to be the Atlanta Falcons starting quarterback yeah. next year. Nobody in the world was saying that they were going to draft Michael Penix inside the top 10, but those things happen. And now there are multiple yeah. outs. Even if Kirk Cousins doesn't get up to speed in this offense, they can turn to Michael Penix and have another option. All of a sudden, the situation that we were terrified of for all these Atlanta pass catchers is great. And I don't know. I'm not even going to pretend to imagine who the quarterback is going to be for the Giants going into next year. But maybe it's something crazy. Maybe Dak Prescott is the quarterback for the Giants yeah. next year. And if that happens, yeah. then all of a sudden we're talking about Malik Neighbors as a top eight dynasty wide receiver. So I'm just going to invest in a guy that I believe to be very talented, not caring too much about the situation because the situation changed like that and it's near impossible to yeah. predict. Yeah, I think that's great advice for anybody listening. It's just... If you believe in a player, just trust that that player is gonna gonna make a difference for your team. So I love that. So you've got Odunze in at five, following the at four. Who's continuing on this this run then at one hundred six? Now I think this one surprises a lot of people. Um, I still have Drake May as my one hundred six, um, and and I get a lot of pushback for this one. But again, um, you know, I cop out, man. I'm 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 not too proud to admit it. I lean on draft capital because, like I said, that is the strongest correlating metric yeah. to future fantasy production. And there are a lot of concerns with Drake May right now. Not with Drake May, with Drake May's situation. You know, we've got Jared Mayo mm -hmm. taking over the Patriots, and we don't know what that's going to look like. I think the casual NFL fan couldn't even name a single wide receiver on the Patriots right now. <laughs> it's bleak. Like, it really doesn't look good, but there is promise that maybe Alex Van Pelt can, you know, inject some sort of hope and optimism into this offense. Um, Drake May is a guy in 2023 redraft and best ball leagues that I'm not especially excited about. But again, situations change. And what happens yeah. if they bring in T. Higgins next year? What if somehow Justin Jefferson gets surprise traded? I, I'm not saying these things are going to happen. I'm saying that unknown things happen all the time. And I think Drake May is a talented quarterback. And even though it might look bleak in 2023, look at Bryce Young, for instance. He had a very yeah. rough situation in 2022. Now, all of a sudden, he's got Deontay Johnson there. He's got Jonathan Brooks there. He's got Jatavian Sanders there. They brought in Dave Canales. He is in a completely different situation. And the entire kind of mind palace that we had built up around why we didn't like Bryce Young 
Now we're suddenly very in on Bryce Young, and we could see that same sort of thing happen after this year with Drake May. Or maybe Drake May is just really good. I remember going into last year, a lot of people saying C.J. Stroud was in a bad situation. You know, Tank <laughs> Dell was a third-round rookie, and Nico Collins had never done much in his career. Who's C.J. Stroud going to throw to? And then he has a record-breaking rookie season. So I am just all about investing in the talent. I think Drake May is a talented player, so I still have him as my 106. Yeah, I think uh, you stick with that. That capital is such a good barometer of of how, at least how much of a chance somebody is going to get as well, which is often overlooked. It's like these guys are going to be willing to give Drake May a couple of chances and, and allow yeah. him to make mistakes, which I think is really good. And I mean, just to show you how quickly a wide receiver room can change, we just waxed lyrical about Caleb Williams's threats and talents that he's got there. Go ask Justin Fields how that was for him <laughs> right. just 12 months ago, right? So it just exactly. it can change so, so quickly. You get in a T. Higgins, they draft a Ted McMillan or a Luther Burden, and all of a sudden, oh, wow, it's amazing. So, yeah, you're right. Don't bet on any – if you're going to bet on one thing in th on the NFL, it's that nothing stays the same. So just yeah, <laughs> right. be, be fluid, right? Absolutely love that. Drake May in at six. Who's following him at seven, then? Um, <clears throat> this one, I, I really struggle between seven and eight, and I'm like thinking about flip-flopping these guys right now while I'm on the mm. show. I've got J.J. McCarthy as my seven, and I know that I've talked yep. about draft capital kind of being a strong barometer for me, and J.J. McCarthy slid a little bit further than people expected. There were talks about him going number two and number yeah. three. I don't yeah. even know if you saw the crazy reports like two days before the draft saying the Bears were thinking about McCarthy over Caleb Williams. It was all yeah. smoke screens, and we know that now, yeah. but he did get drafted um, you know, inside the top 15. He was drafted into a very, very good situation where – Kevin O'Connell has really brought out the best in just about every single quarterback he's coached. And yeah. then, of course, you know, I'm, all this time I've been talking about not buying into situations because situations can change. I'm willing to bend a little bit for my process here because of Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson and Kevin O'Connell and all of the supporting things there. Um, so, so McCarthy is my 107, and I feel like I have succumbed a little bit to the hive mind with moving him up here. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the the ceiling for him in this offense is just sky high. So I'm willing to take the risk on him here. He's uh, the weirdest player to evaluate because if anyone looks you dead in the eye and say, I know exactly what type of player JJ McCarthy is, I just don't see how you can though because there's so little to see because he was asked to do so little. But I've said it before in this show, so I'm glad you brought it up, Dave, is I trust Kevin O'Connell so much. Mm -hmm. I think exactly. that he's going to be a guy that, that can shape and mold. And it might be quite cool for him, actually, to get someone like McCarthy, who is at least one thing I see that he is, is disciplined, right? He is asked to run this very minimal scheme, and you don't see any complaints about it. You see him just doing his job. And if he listens to Kevin O'Connell and just does his job, then pff, wheels up. Yeah. So the next one, I yeah. think this is the uh, the big tier drop off. You know, we've talked about these kind yeah. of micro tiers inside here. One hundred eight. I don't even think I need to say it. You know who it is? Brock Bowers. You know, drafted yep. highly in the draft. Um, already getting comps to all of the elite tight ends we've seen. Um, yep. I'm, I'm not crazy about the landing spot here. Um, I, I think long term it's not going to matter because he yeah. is going to, um, you know, just be a talented player and he can kind of take over. But uh, this year, you know, Michael Mayer is still there. A guy that they just invested premium ca uh, draft capital in last year. Obviously, Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers are there this year. And, well, I think Gardner Minshew might be a little bit underrated. I'm not, you know, thrilled about the idea of Gardner Minshew supporting three or four fantasy-relevant players here. But at the end yeah. of the day, I think the Raiders did the smart thing here. I think that they had their eyes set on a quarterback. Um, we heard rumors about them being interested in Bo Nix. We heard rumors about them being interested in Penix. And I think when both of those guys went off the board, I think they panicked a little bit, but I think they did the right hmm. thing by taking best player available. And there might not yeah. be an immediate need for Brock Bowers right now, but they're doing what you want to see a rebuilding team doing and just taking the best player available. So Brock Bowers, you know, had an elite profile at Georgia. He does everything you want to see for a tight end. He's athletic. He draws targets. He makes plays after the catch. He scores touchdowns. He draws targets deep downfield. He can run every route. And he's also a good blocker, which doesn't help us in fantasy, but it will get him on the field quickly. So, uh, Brock Bowers is the, the pretty easy kind of de facto 108 here. And then, it's after 108. And that's what I said when we started the show. Like if you're rebuilding and you have multiple picks inside yeah. the top eight, that's when you're feeling good about it. 
we're in no man's land once you get to pick 109. I mean, I could, I could make yeah. arguments for five or six different guys to go 109. I think it's this top eight is where there is a very clear yeah. defined tier where you're getting safe players with tremendous upside. Absolutely agree. And you know, the, the weird thing is that the the readers end up missing on on Penix on this very show a couple of months ago. I spoke about how I could just see Michael Penix in that Raiders uniform and then said they might take him at 15. And then we we both kind of chatted and went, No, you're probably right. That's probably way too high for Michael Penix. And then sure enough, <laughs> he goes like what eight overall or six whatever he ended I, up. Like, yeah, but yeah. We we did a mock draft. Uh Alfredo Brown, my co-host at on the Football Guys Fantasy Football Show. We did a mock draft where we went back and forth. I had odd numbers, he had even numbers, and we were kind of yeah. picking for each team. And I picked Penix to the Raiders. And the YouTube comments were just, you idiot, what are you talking about? <laughs> Penix is terrible, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, I mean, I was shocked to see Penix go as high as he did, but I thought the Raiders made a lot of sense. And that was the kind of yeah. smoke that we had heard is that the Raiders were interested, but man, that, uh, that, that that made for a fun draft night when he went at eight. <laughs> yeah, although I, I've mentioned this maybe once or twice before, so apologies people heard me say this before, but can we get a muzzle on the rap sheet, please? What is he doing spoiling? <laughs> <laughs> like, why is he in there talking about Michael Penix uh -huh. being drafted? I want that kind of ruined it a little bit for me, Dave. I don't know about you. Yeah, we also get uh, Albert Breer out there. Like, somehow Albert Breer knows every pick 30 seconds before it comes in. Yeah. Um, and it was tough. We were doing a live stream during the draft. And, like, you know, we, we we see all of these things. You know, I've got notifications on for Rap and Breer and all these guys. And yeah. we're trying to react live as people are watching the broadcast. And it's like we see the pick come in. And, like, we know Michael Penix was picked, but we don't want to blow it for our viewers who are watching it. Yeah. We're, like, trying to contain our excitement. Like, it's – yeah, it makes <laughs> – Yeah, I, I like when everybody is just, you know, uh, the, 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 there's no reason for a 10 or 15-second edge when it comes to draft picks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but uh... – Overall, circle we kind of went off that, but circle back. Brock Bowers, great prospect. Last thing on Bowers, if we did have even a small premium here, do you flip him and McCarthy? You said you were sort of torn. Would that premium be enough to flip them for you? Yeah, in tight end premium, actually, I'm moving Bowers up ahead of May and McCarthy. So I'm taking him right after Williams, Daniels, and the big three wide receivers. So I'd move him up a few spots for that. I actually just took Brock Bowers third overall in the league. Is a very different yeah. league. It was a must start two tight ends, like mm -hmm. one and a half point premium league. And I was like, I'm taking Brock Bowers all the way up here. I'm in one of those. And we did a pre draft rookie draft. And I got Bowers at 108 in a start two tight end, oh. 1.5 premium. And I was thrilled when he got drafted yeah. as highly as he did because there were some concerns. A lot of people were saying, you know, I'm sure you saw the talk where they were saying you don't want to draft a tight end high because of how much you have to pay him on the rookie contract and he's going to fall outside of the top 20. I was thrilled to see him get drafted yeah. as high as he did. Yeah, absolutely love Brock Bowers. So that's the end of like the big sort of elite tier. Now we get into, uh, yeah, you mentioned no man's land, right? So who's who's the top of this no man's land tier for you then? Now, this one might sound crazy to a lot of people, and I just find myself continuing to move him up after the pre-draft process and the more we hear, but I'm going with Michael Penix at 109. And wow. I know it sounds crazy because Kirk Cousins is there, but if you look at the Atlanta Falcons um, just a few years back, they ate $40 million in dead cap to get Matt Ryan off the roster when he yeah. wasn't looking like a great quarterback. So they're a team that has shown a willingness to just – cut a quarterback and eat the dead cap and move on. And when they have another quarterback sitting in lieu on a rookie contract, it makes it even easier to potentially eat that dead cap. So we might not see Penix start at all this year. We might not see him start at all next year. But the Falcons invested premium draft capital in Mike Penix. And you want to talk about situation. Is his situation that much different than J.J. McCarthy, where he's just surrounded by talented weapons, probably yeah. won't be the week one starter. But, you know, Kirk Cousins is getting up there in age. He's coming off of a brutal season-ending injury on his plant foot. What happens if he retweaks that injury? All of a sudden, we're looking at Michael Penix as a weekly top 12 quarterback in, in, in weekly rankings. And then if they decide to move on from him last year or after this year, then we're looking at Michael Penix as the, the, the starter for the next four plus years for a Falcons team that is dripping with offensive talent. So again, it just comes down to operating in the unknown. We don't know exactly what this team is going to look like at the midpoint of this season going into 2025, but they invested premium draft capital in Mike Penix. He's in a good situation with talented pass catchers, and I'm just willing to invest in that profile. And 
I think what's maybe lost in a couple of people as well is, sure, they obviously invested that draft capital on Mike Penix, but I'm sure he's not cheap either, right? These rookies still get paid, and I, th- I believe that the higher you're taking, the more money you get, right? That's the kind of structure. He mm-hmm. must be on at least 10 to 15 million a year, right? He's got to be. Less than that, it's a four-year deal with $22 million, and then they'll have okay, the okay. fifth-year option that they could pick up if they choose to, and I don't think that number is out yet, but that'll probably be around 25 to $30 million by the time that hits, so the fifth-year option would be a little, uh, quite a bit more, but they've got him for just over $5 million a year, which... You know, for for a quarterback, oh, especially sorry, if he's I, starting, I said per year. To, I said per year. Apologies. I think I said. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I meant fifteen. Yeah. Million. So it's even more than fifteen million. Sorry, it's twenty twenty old. Twenty two million for the next four years. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, that's just just a hair over five million dollars per year. Which you're not getting any veteran quarterback for five million dollars per year. I'm like you yeah. we were just kind of cracking jokes about Gardner Minshew, and I think Gardner Minshew is making more than Vegas this year. <laughs> yeah, probably is. But yeah, like, like they're. Yeah, you, you don't pay a guy twenty million dollars to ride the bench. Surely he's gonna he's gonna play soon, right? That's it right. as well. I love Penix moving up. That's the kind of one that I can just see in like a two years time. People going, damn it, like I should have goddamn taken Michael Penix yeah. earlier. Like that's gonna be one that people will kick themselves. At. So I love the placement there, aggressive placement. But in super flex, you got to be aggressive with the quarterback. So he's locked in at nine. Who's going at pick ten for you, Dave? And I got another aggressive one here for you, Bo Nix. And you can yeah. tell, you know, like I said, you know, you want to invest uh, y- y- your first round picks. You want safe players. And Bo Nix is really the forgotten guy in this draft. And I think, you know, the age concerns are certainly valid, but his skill set matches up so well with what Sean Payton wants to do. I never really understood Russell Wilson getting brought into Denver to, to be paired up with Sean Payton because that is the complete opposite type of quarterback that we've seen yeah. Sean Payton historically find success with. He wants a guy that can get the ball out of his hands quick. They can hit those short timing routes. And if you look, um, I don't know how familiar you are with PFF, but PFF breaks down um, passing depth by uh, mm-hmm. passes 20 plus yards downfield, passes that are 10 to 20 yards downfield, passes that are at the line of scrimmage to 10 yards downfield, and then passes that are behind the line of scrimmage. For passes behind the line of scrimmage, which are your behind the line of scrimmage throws, short throws, which are 0 to 9 yards, and intermediate yep. throws, which are 10 to 20 yards, Bo Nix graded as the best quarterback for all of those. He struggles a little bit wow. with the deep ball, but we're not going to see a lot of the deep ball. I mean, Bo Nix, as crazy as it sounds, his skill set is very similar to what we saw from like a 38, 39, 40-year-old Drew Brees, where he is going yeah. to drop back as soon as he hits that back foot. He's going to hit one of his receivers in stride. So I know there's a lot of jokes about Bo Nix, how he was drafted early and how he's too old to be a first-round pick and all these <laughs> things. But at the end of the day, he is a polished, pro-ready quarterback who is going to be starting week one. And it's crazy to me that I see him falling into the middle of the second round in drafts right now. He's He's got a chance, right? He's a quarterback with a chance. And almost, almost every starting quarterback right now with a chance, and probably at least two years, you'd imagine, the where they took him. You'd pay a first round pick for them, so why not spend a first round pick on them, right? So I think I think it's good good advice to go and get Bo Nix. Do you realize that Sean Payton has a chance to do the funniest thing anyone has ever done? By the way, if he gives Bo Nix Russell Wilson's old office, that is just oh my goodness, <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, it, it could happen, it could happen, but uh, I really I, I just so. yeah, I, I like the landing spot for Bo Nix. I think that his skill set is just perfect for what Sean Payton wants, and and you know I, I get it, like people were surprised by the pick and people are holding on to their pre-draft priors about Bo Nix and that he wouldn't be a good quarterback and that he's too old to be a first round pick. I'm just throwing all those concerns out the window. We saw premium draft capital invested in Bo Nix with a, uh, with a, a coach that really wants this type of quarterback and he has almost no competition to be the week one starter. Yeah, exactly. So we got the, we got those six quarterbacks off the board now we got two picks left in the first round where are you going with 111 dip now this is really pick your poison i mean i, I think you know we're going to see a yeah. run of similar players here um and I, I you know i i like some of these guys i don't like some as much but we talked about it at the start of the show that there was a big run of wide receivers in the late first mm-hmm. early second round and i'm gonna go with brian thomas as the the guy that i prefer of that bunch um you know last year we saw calvin ridley really trying to get, uh, you know, what, what do they say, a square peg into a round hole. They were trying to make yeah. Calvin Ridley something he wasn't. 
But that role in that offense is so much better suited for Brian Thomas. At this point in his career, Brian Thomas isn't the most polished route runner. He can't do a lot after the catch, but he can beat people deep and get behind defenses and make those big plays. And they were asking Calvin Ridley, who is a technician on short and intermediate routes, yeah. to just run downfield and run these nine routes last year. And he struggled a little bit with uh, the deep ball tracking and never really got on the same page with Trevor Lawrence. But I think that Brian Thomas could make that jump this year. So, um, again, a lot of it comes down to draft capital for me. He was drafted uh, ab above the rest of the guys. But I also do like the landing spot, kind of playing um, – just such a different role than the two guys we see right now that have been commanding the lion's share of the targets in Jacksonville. Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram both play, you know, the majority yeah. of their routes are five to 15 yards off the line of scrimmage. We can see Brian Thomas operate way deeper downfield and have a pretty high ceiling in this offense. One of the things I really, really like about, about Brian Thomas is, and it's sort of a stat that has sort of flown yeah, under the radar, though, that red zone. At red zone targeting that like Calvin mm -hmm. Ridley got, Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah, he was the the head of college football for touchdown receptions last year. So he's, I just think it's a a perfect match. Whenever Brian Thomas Jr. was drafted by Jacksonville, I think everybody went, yeah, like correct, like that's the correct pick. That's exactly where he should have went. That's exactly where I wanted to go. And I thought it was mind blowing that they traded back when Brian Thomas was on the board. And I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like you, this team needs Brian Thomas. And then they traded back and still got their guy. Like there's not, and you've yeah. probably done that in dynasty trades before as well, where you trade back <laughs> a few picks and still get the guy you originally wanted. Is there anything that feels better than that? Oh, that is just, yeah, that. And yeah, sometimes if you can like, if you're torn between two guys and you wait a whole round and the same guy comes back to you a whole round later, it's just, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's it's the absolute best. So yeah, the Jags got a little taste of that, I'm sure. So we got Brian Thomas locked in. Brian Thomas, of course, coming to London this year. The Jags come to London every single year, so we might even get a chance to see him play live, which would be pretty cool. So we got one player left in the first round. Dave, who are you going with? One twelve. Uh, I'm planting a flag on Xavier Worthy, and I've been burned by many a Chiefs <laughs> wide receiver. I was in oh, on yeah. Moore. I was in on Justin Ross. I was so excited when Kadarius Tony went there, but maybe, <laughs> maybe Xavier Worthy could be the guy. Like maybe, right? Um, yeah. You know, if you look since Tyreek Hill left, and I just wrote an article. It was funny. I was writing a deep dive article on Marquise Brown, and about halfway through the article. It just kind of dawned on me. I was like, everything I'm saying about Marquise Brown, Brown can be applicable to Xavier Worthy as well. Basically, since Tyreek Hill has left the Chiefs, we have seen this huge delineation in how the receivers are used. Last year, yeah. this step blows my mind. Last year, every single receiver in Kansas City either had an ADOT, a target depth of less than 10 yards or more than 17 yards. They didn't have a single guy that could do more than one thing. They were either saying you're running nothing but short routes or you're doing nothing but clearing out the back of the defense. And yeah. MBS and Justin Watson were fourth and fifth in the league in target depth last year. Rashi Rice and Kadarius Toney were last and second to last in the league in target depth last wow. year. And what we saw with Tyreek Hill throughout his career is that he could run every route. You know, he could win deep. He could win short. He could make plays after the catch. He can win inside. He could win outside. He can go across the middle of the field. He can get outside the numbers. He could do it all. And I think, uh, first of all, I think it's impossible to replace Tyreek Hill because I think his skill set, what he yeah. does, is kind of a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. But I think that Andy Reid has been looking for that player, a guy that they can use as kind of a, 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 a queen piece on a chessboard that you can line up anywhere on the field, that can run any route, that can win deep, that can win short and do all that. And like I said, we saw it with Sky Moore and Justin Ross, and we saw it with Kadarius Tony. They've been trying to fulfill this role. And I think this year they doubled down by signing Marquise Brown and drafting Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy is a much more polished route runner than I think people believe they see that yeah. 40 time and they think that he's another John Ross or another Darius Hayward Bay or something like that but he is a much better route runner and can do a lot more than that so I don't know if it's going to be Xavier Worthy taking that step forward maybe it's going to be Marquise Brown but the upside for Worthy if he could be that guy that can do everything is so high that I'm willing to take him at the end of the first yeah, I think the the big difference with Xavier Worthy and, and guys like John Ross that you, you mentioned before, Worthy was going here 
before the combine. Like people were drafting him around here even before right. he broke that record because mm-hmm. they love the the talent that they've seen over at Texas from Xavier Worthy. And you're right, there's a gaping hole in that Chiefs team. And I mean, just someone who can catch a time like one in every ten passes were dropped by Kansas City last year, which is oh, absolutely <laughs> insane. So yeah, if he can come in and just catch some targets in that middle of the field. That is just huge. And with all the stuff of Rashi Rice, it's just every everywhere you look, it's another tick for Xavier Worthy. But mm-hmm. I just really hope I be yeah, you're right. I, I'm actually a Chiefs fan, so I've just been right. I've been burned in fantasy by that as well. Because I've been such a homer. I just keep taking the Chiefs guys. Sky oh. brief note on Sky Moore. Is Sky Moore cuttable in Dynasty now? Is that have we got have we got that far? I, I think so. I, I really think so. Like I I think I might even prefer Justin Ross ahead of Sky Moore. Like if I'm looking yeah. for one guy to stash deep on my bench, I think Justin Moore or uh, uh, Justin Ross has more upside. I mean, Sky Moore. I think at this point we can just kind of label him a bust. Um, you know, couldn't even get on the field last year in one of the worst wide receiver rooms in the league. Yeah, that's crazy. Like I can't believe we had come around so fast. Poor first guy, but Xavier Worthy's not. We're not going to be saying this in two years' time, Dave. We're going to be talking about how a steal Xavier Worthy was at the one twelve for sure. Not let's hope so. More, so. Let's hope so. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. So, Dave, that brings us into the second round. We're going to speed things up a bit in the second round. Yeah. What I'd like you to do sorry, is I like to talk. Me... I, I, I'm a rambler. I'm oh, sorry. Me too, man. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll love the chat as well. Uh, so we're going to go. If you give me two one, two two, and two three. And then we'll maybe focus in on one guy to chat about a little bit more. Yeah, so for me, uh, the way that I prefer these guys, the next three, uh, Jonathan Brooks at 201, Lad McConkey at 202, and Ricky Pearsall at 203. Um, I don't know who you'd like to talk about. Uh, Let's go with Jonathan Brooks, because Jonathan Brooks is a guy that I just absolutely love um you know he has everything you want to see and in a three down back in the nfl he's landing on a team where dave canales has really preferred to have a lead back so rashad white last year one of the least Hmm. efficient running backs in the nfl just fed touches we saw it two years ago where ken walker was getting fed touches in seattle and i think the sneaky thing that people don't realize about jonathan brooks is how good he is as a receiver as well Mm -hmm. i was looking at power five running backs last year he graded as the best rusher in the league and the second, or I'm sorry, the, the best pass catching running back in the league and the second best oh, wow. run, uh, rushing running back in the league behind only Travion Henderson. So this guy wow. has all the skill sets you want to see. I think the reason he's kind of suppressed in value right now is because of this pre-draft narrative where everyone said all of these running backs suck. But we saw him get drafted in the second round to a team that needs a running back on a much improved Panthers offense. So big, big fan of Jonathan Brooks. And uh, right now, I mean, this is kind of where he's going at the top of the first round. I think he's going to be the biggest steal in drafts this year. I have traded away Kyron Williams shares and Devon Achan shares to bring in Jonathan Brooks. That's how confident I am in his uh, future success. Love that. That is that is bold with it. Not not with the Karen shares. I've got my issues with Karen, but the Achan shares. I mean, yeah, that is that is that is bold. I absolutely love it going out and and get your guy. And I think that narrative of you know these running backs suck. I, I truly believe if Jonathan Brooks is healthy the whole way through to the end of the year, I don't think that narrative is there. I think it is. Wow, Jonathan Brooks is great, and then there's the other guys. I think that would have been the narrative. And I know this is a dynasty show, but I'm even taking Jonathan Brooks and Brooks and redraft in best ball. Yeah, like, he might not do anything to start the year, but if he can be fully up to speed by the halfway point of the season and be that late season hammer where he's getting 15, 20 touches in the second half of the season. Right now, you can get him in like round eight, nine, ten of your 2024 redraft and best ball leagues. Yeah. And he could easily kind of fit that league winner narrative where you're getting him for super cheap. And he is just a workhorse down the stretch and through the playoffs. Do you know what I'm noticing about last thing on Brooks? I'm noticing, and it's it's more of a general thing, and I don't know if you've got any insight on on why this might happen, but I'm seeing Brooks go around yeah this 11, 12, like 201 area in the rookie drafts. But as soon as you switch it over to a dynasty startup, he's going ahead of a lot of these guys. Why do you think that is that certain players get faded in a rookie draft but get pushed way up when it becomes a startup? I don't I don't quite understand it. I couldn't tell you, and I notice that all the time. Like startup ADP and rookie ADP do not always align, and it is very confusing to me. Right now, I have Brooks inside my top eight dynasty running backs. I'm I'm that confident in him. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for your question. I see this all the time, and it is one of the weirdest 
just anomalies in in dynasty football that rookie draft ADP and startup rookie ADP do not align. I don't know what causes that. Yeah, sounds like an article coming to you at Football Guys very soon. So I, stay I tuned. You're right. guys. I might dig into this. That be, yeah. yeah, that sounds like a good thing to dig into for sure, Dave. So you got your two one, two and three in. So who's in at two four, two five, and two six for you? So this is a uh, again. There's a little tear break after these three, yep. and for me, it's a uh, Keon Coleman, Xavier Leggett. And Trey Benson. Yep. Um, those are the next three for me. And again, if you're trying to trade around rookie picks to get into a certain spot, if you can't get into the top eight, I think this is the next tier you want to get into. Um, all of these guys have the draft capital we want to see. Lad McConkey, Ricky yep. Pierce, all Keon Coleman, Xavier Legat were all kind of that late first, early second round run that I talked about. Um, I prefer Keon Coleman a little bit because I think that his skill set is going to match up well with Josh Allen's skill set. Josh Allen is mm -hmm. just going to throw him YOLO balls and just say, go up there and get it. And I think that that could work yeah. out well for him. Xavier Leggett, I don't dislike as much as other people do. He got first round mm -hmm. draft capital and the Panthers actually, yep. if I recall, they traded up to get him, right? Yeah, yeah, very deliberate think, move. Just one spot, I think, just to get probably that fifth year option, right? Exactly. Yeah, and and I think the reason people are kind of scared is because we've seen the Panthers go after a lot of these guys. They want that guy that can kind of do it all. And Jonathan Mingo failed, and Lavisca Chenault failed, and Curtis Samuel, you know, showed some flashes but didn't really put it together. And I think a lot of people just see Leggett as being the next one of these highly drafted busts in Carolina. But I'm willing to go back to the well. Um, and then Trey Benson, I just think he's a very talented guy. Uh, we're, we're not drafting Trey Benson for any 2024 outlook. We're drafting him to hopefully be the heir apparent to mm -hmm. James Conner in this high-powered Cardinals offense. Big question I've been toying with just in the last last minute since you drafted these two back-to-back. -back. Both great guys. Who are you going for a beer with? Keon Coleman or Xavier Leggett? Because that's a tough choice. Uh, Leggett for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can listen to that guy talk for days, uh, man. Just yeah. talking about horses and being out on the farm. <laughs> he's, he's great. And I love those country boys too, man. Like yeah. Zamir White, I don't know if you've heard him talk. He's another one uh, that just like spends his off-season out on the farm, tending to his horses. I, I love guys like that. To, he either has really small horses or he's a lot bigger than I. I <laughs> it's just a minute, man. That, that guy is absolutely huge. Yeah, so yeah, big season for him. Cut up for sure. So we got those three guys locked in. We got two more groups of three. So let's run with the 70 and nine. Not our Dave. Uh, Adonai Mitchell, who I was very mm -hmm. surprised to see him fall the way that he did. I told you we were live streaming yeah. during the draft and it was for like 10 straight picks. I was like, this has to be Adonai Mitchell, right? And, yeah. it wasn't. and he just kept falling and falling and falling. Um, I'm a big fan of his talent, man. I think he is just as good as Xavier Worthy and was shocked to see him fall. Uh, after mm -hmm. that, though, Roman Wilson and Blake Corum. Um, Corum's the guy I'll talk about a little bit here. Roman Wilson, yeah. you know, polished route runner, good opportunity, can kind of fit into that Deontay Johnson role. Yeah. But Blake Corum, um, I know you said you have some issues with Kyron Williams. I, I did, um, yeah. Uh, you know, he's he's undersized. He has had a history of injuries. So much of his production last year came in the passing game and the touchdowns, which is great. And he, you know, had an awesome fantasy season. But efficiency wise, he was one of the worst rushers in football last year. And then in steps Blake Corum, who is younger, bigger, faster, stronger, more explosive. I don't think that they're saying Kyron Williams is out of a job. I don't think that at all. I no. think, you know, Kyron Williams has fallen in ADP a little bit. He's going in the two, three turn now and redraft in best ball. And I think that's kind of a, a fair value for him. But what we've seen historically is Sean McVay will just flip his running back one like without hesitation yeah. and we've seen him support daryl henderson who was like an rb1 for half of a season we've seen sony michelle look good in this yeah. offense and I, I i think kyron william is the guy here but man if something happens like i said kyron williams is injury prone he's missed some time over his career he's yeah. already missing otas with this this you know mysterious foot injury and that's what i like about blake corum is for the next four years whether it's uh you know for for a week at a time or for half a season at a time or maybe Kyron Williams walks after his rookie contract, we are going to get weekly RB one production from Blake Corum at some point. So I'm going to draft him, knowing that you might not get four years of workhorse uh, volume, but you're going to get these weeks where you can plug him in as a top ten guy. And there's, I know it's really tricky. Maybe the the trickiest thing to rely on in the NFL is 
can you get me touchdowns? But that is Blake Corum's superpower. Like yep. that guy has got such a nose for the end zone that even if there is a split, I just don't see how you would ever choose Kyron Williams to be the guy to push the line whenever you've got Blake Corum there, who's that is the one thing that if he's good at something, you would pick that. So even even if he has less time on the field, he's still going to siphon away a lot from Kyron anyway. So I, I'm delighted with with and, Blake Corum. That I think he's got. And I don't think people realize. Touchdown. I don't think people realize how much of Kyron Williams' production came off of touchdowns last year. Christian McCaffrey and Raheem mm-hmm. Mostert were the only players that had more touchdowns than Kyron Williams. And yep. you know, Kyron Williams, there there were so many games where you'd watch and you know he 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 was couldn't find any room on the ground, but he'd finish the game with six catches and two touchdowns and finishes a top three running back. But if you watch the film and you look at the efficiency numbers, he did leave a lot on the field. So I'm not saying Kyron Williams is out of a job. That's not what I'm implying at all. But it's impossible to ignore that they invested day two draft capital into a running back. That tells me that they probably have some of the same concerns about Kyron Williams that a lot of dynasty and fantasy players have taken note of. Sell Kyron Williams video coming to you soon on the dynasty hot seat, by the way, a little inside baseball for you there, Dave. Coming, coming real soon. So we've got, we got three more picks to go in round number two. Who's wrapping up the round for you, Dave? Malachi Corley, Ben yep. Sinnott, and Jalen Polk. Malachi Corley. Let's get Ben it's up, I, I Let's say uh, like Marshawn Lloyd in is kind of like an honorable mention because he would be the next pick and split mm-hmm. hairs between Polk and, and Lloyd. Um, but I want to talk about Malachi Corley because this is probably my spiciest yeah. ranking of all of them. Yeah. I don't know. And Malachi Corley is a guy that I've been consistently drafting in round three. And that's the nice thing is like my rankings don't always align with ADP. So even though mm-hmm. I would take Malachi Corley as high as 2010, like or 210, like we have him here, the nice thing is you could probably get him at the end of the third round. And I just think yeah. that he is a very, very talented player. Love what he can do after the catch. And when you start looking at ceiling outcomes, his ceiling is so high. He's a, an underrated route runner. Um, we didn't see mm-hmm. him doing much in college besides just kind of catching screens and slants. But I also think that That skill set kind of pairs up with what Aaron Rodgers is trying to do now. We're not going to see Aaron Rodgers from 10 years ago scrambling all over the field, making plays outside of the structure of the offense. I think we're going to see him taking a lot of snaps out of the shotgun and trying to immediately hit the open guy. So I think we see a lot of um, manufactured touches going Malachi Corley's way. And the comp that I saw when I was watching Malachi Corley play, when I was watching his college film, I kept thinking, man, this guy looks like Randall Cobb. And now, mm. all of a sudden, you know, mm. he gets to play that role for Aaron Rodgers. So, um, I, I, and the last thing I'll say about him, I don't know, did you see the video on draft day when they drafted Malachi Corley? And, like, everybody in the Jets draft room was going ballistic. Like, they were kind of trying to nice. trade up for him, and they were so excited to get him. So, this is a guy that I think a lot of people have some reasonable concerns about in his profile and his ability to run the full route tree and all that. But I think that he's going to be manufactured touches on what projects to be a good offense. So I'm willing to reach for him if I have to. You know something I've had to catch myself with Corley a few times and I don't know, I don't know why it is, but I keep going, Oh, he, he might not be good because the, the, the Jets have already got Garrett Wilson. And I know that, teams are more than able to support more than one wide receiver. I think it's just because that wide receiver room has been so bad for so long and Garrett Wilson's been getting all the targets that I think that's just going to continue to happen. But that's not going to happen, right? They're going to use more than one person. And and I'll also say that they are such different archetypes of receivers. It's kind of the same thing that I've been saying all offseason about Marquise Brown and um, Xavier Worthy. I don't think that Rashi Rice, I actually think that Rashi Rice being suspended would be bad for them because they are Mm -hmm. such different types of receivers, it's good when you can have two guys that are doing very different things. Rashi Rice is a threat underneath. And then if you have Brown and Worthy going over the top, that just makes defenses on their toes. They don't know where the ball is going. Similarly, Garrett Wilson is going to be 10, 15 yards downfield. And then you've got Corley working underneath. They complement each other's skill sets so well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great position for Corley there. I can't wait to see what he does with fully. Healthy Aaron Rodgers, who's did, did they put him in the same game? Did I see that in the schedules? He played in the same game again, Dave. Uh huh. Week one, uh, I forget if it's Sunday night or Monday night, it's the same that it was last year. And to add to it, uh, I'm drawing a blank where he was traded to, but Leonard Floyd is the one that um ended his yeah. career last year, and now Leonard mm-hmm. Floyd is on the team that they're playing week one. So, oh man, uh, I, I had high hopes for the Jets and Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall and all of it last year. 
um, and, uh, you know, crushed, crushed those hopes three snaps into the season, hoping that yeah. we can see Rodgers rewind the clock. I'm a Bears fan, all right? I, like, I shouldn't be cheering for Aaron Rodgers, but <laughs> I, I always say that it is much more fun to be a fan of the sport and just love the sport. I never understood fans that like hate other teams yeah. and hate players. I just don't have energy for that. I like football. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback that I have watched during my lifetime. So even though he played on my rival and I saw him just beating down my bears year after year after year, <laughs> I, I couldn't help but appreciate it. And I root for the guy because he is just so fun to watch when he's on. Do Hickey comes out with a flag? Do Hickey does that again? Does he come out with a flag? Does he do? Does he just run it back the whole thing? I hope not, man. <laughs> I really <laughs> hope not. Yeah, that uh, I don't know. It's Aaron Rodgers. I, you can never predict what Aaron Rodgers is going to do, but I can't. <laughs> I can't wait to watch whatever it is. And Dave, before I let you go, everyone's favorite topic is these sleeper players, right? So, do you have a guy? I know you sort of briefly mentioned Marshall Lloyd, but is there a guy like maybe in the later rounds that you're like, dude, I need? this is my guy like later on i'm snapping up so many because often these sleeper picks in the third and fourth round end up being like your most owned rookie players just because of of your thoughts about do you have any guys that you're like i can't stop drafting this guy later on yeah i don't even know if this guy's like a sleeper anymore because everybody's talking about him but i love the skill set and the opportunity for tyrone tracy jr um you know talking in whether it's dynasty i think the reasonable concerns are his age you know he's very Mm -hmm. old for a running back and um that certainly is concerning but i think when you're drafting a running back especially when you're drafting a running back in the fourth or fifth round of your rookie draft you're not saying you know i'm hoping for eight years of production from this guy which like if you're drafting jonathan brooks you probably are looking for like five to eight years of production i think with tyrone tracy if he can be the guy for the next two to three years you're feeling good about that this is a converted wide receiver um so you know he's going to be plenty involved in the passing game. His only competition for touches right now is Devin Singletary, and I, I, there's a little bit of concern there. You know, Brian Dable yeah. really likes Devin Singletary, but Tyrone Tracy is just a big dude. He's a bruiser. He's a thumper. Reminds me a lot of Rashad White. He's got that pass-catching upside as well. And if you look at the Giants, they're not going to be a good team, so I don't want to you know try to project too much here but this is a team where we could see them playing from behind and when teams are playing from behind that's when we see running backs get even more involved in the passing game so Tyrone Tracy is a guy that I'm taking as early as round four but he's fallen to me in round five quite a few times because of the age concerns um he is one of my favorite late round guys to target yeah absolutely love I'm right there with you with Tracy I've already scooped up a couple of shares of him already and Dave that brings us to the end of the show. Just sort of say it. Thank you so much once again for for hopping on the Dynasty Hot Seat and talking about this 2024 rookie class. Can you just remind everybody, listen, Dave, where can they find all of your great work online? Yeah, it's super simple these days. You can find everything over at Football Guys, um, footballguys.com. I've got my rankings, articles, videos. I've got the Football Guys Fantasy Football Show that we are now ramping up to doing twice a week with Alfredo Brown. I've also got the live stream on the Football Guys channel that I do on Friday afternoons where we draft a best ball mania team. Um, we're going to be ramping up. I'm actually taking next week off. I'm taking a little mini vacation, but when I come back from that vacation, we'll be up to three episodes a week and then up to five episodes a week in season. So you can follow me on Twitter at Dave Kluge and see everything that I'm up to over there. Absolutely love it. So thank you once again. And thanks, of course, to you as well, listening. If you've not already, that thumbs up and that subscribe button. Hey, they're right there, right beneath you, right? If you're listening, if you're full screen, hit that little escape bar. I promise they're, they're right there. You can find them. Make sure you've done all that good stuff. So one more time from Dave, from myself, this has been the Dynasty Hot Seat. And remember, for anything Dynasty, you need to know, keep it locked on the Certified Inferno. We'll see you next time. Bye. 